It's the beginning of a new sermon series that we're going to be uh, going through and looking at this uh, Philippian letter, Philippians, a uh, short letter that Apostle Paul wrote. If you got a bulletin, uh, then I hope you got a little insert. I've got one here somewhere. It looks like this, and that's the outline. We'd encourage you to follow along and fill in the blanks if you like to do that. If you don't, that's, that's fine too. But I'm excited also about the, the first service. As I said, we had good attendance, and that service ended with uh, three additions by transfer and the baptism of, of Merritt Miller. And uh, for those of you who've known Merritt for some time, you know that's the answer to a lot of prayers. And we just rejoice and thank the Lord today for that decision on his part. And I'm glad to be in this service and excited about this message. I think it's going to bless our hearts as we look at what Paul says. How to enjoy the people in your life. How to enjoy the people in your life. Let's begin reading with verse 3 of the first chapter. Paul says, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. He says, It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart. For whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Let us go to God in prayer. Our loving Heavenly Father, we just thank you so very much today for the outpouring of your love in our hearts. And we're thankful today that as we come in this hour, that again we're able to turn our attention to the pages of your word, that word that has been inspired, has been preserved for us through the ages. And Father, we pray right now that you would open up our hearts and our minds. And that, Father, as we are in the very beginning of a new year, that you would help us to learn today these principles that will help us to enjoy the people in our lives, our spouses and our parents and our children and our co-workers, both on the, in the Monday through Saturday world and in the church and, and in our neighborhoods. Father, we just pray that, that your spirit would plant these words deep into our hearts and that when we go forth from this building in a few moments, Father, that then we might begin to put into use the things that we've learned and that they might bless our lives. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As I said, we're going to be looking at several weeks now for, at the Philippian epistle. And Philippians is a, is a personal book. It tells us a whole lot about the Apostle Paul himself, about his life and about his attitudes, the way he looked at things. It's a very practical book as well. As you'll see today and in the weeks to follow as we continue in this series of messages that Philippians deals with, with right where you and I live. It deals with the problems that, that we encounter every day and will give us some sound advice, some, some just real solid stuff about how to deal with those problems and how to work through those problems with, with the Lord's help. But it's also a very positive book because you'll notice you read this letter, and, and let me encourage you, though this is not the first book on our Bible reading program for the year, let me encourage you in the weeks to follow to read Philippians, in fact, several times. I think it will help you be prepared to come and hear these messages each Sunday. But you'll find as you read that the word joy, the word rejoice, the, the word uh, or words be glad are used numerous times, at least 17 times we find those types of words uh, in the book. And so it's a, it's a fun book. And, and I think that we will be able to see that the Apostle Paul was saying to the Philippian Christians back there in the first century and to us today here at Avalon in the 20th century that living the Christian life ought to be an enjoyable thing. It, it ought not be boring. It ought not be humdrum. It ought not be uh, something that, that we uh, resent 
or that we, we chafe under, under the yoke, but that it ought to be something that brings us a lot of joy, a lot of excitement, a lot of fun. That's not to say that there are not difficulties, and not, that's not to say that we don't have those blue Mondays from time to time, but it's to say that overall, it's neat being a Christian. It's fun to live for the Lord Jesus Christ. And today, as we start off in the first chapter, Paul begins right off the bat by talking about people, how to enjoy the people in our lives. And because really, uh, let's be real, I'm going to be real plain spoken about this. If relationships are bad, life stinks. Isn't that true? Yeah. If you're just going through day after day and you've got bad relationships at home, at work, life stinks. If relationships are, are strained, life is difficult at the very best. If we have problems with people, what does it do? It kills the joy in our life. And, and we've already established that, that Jesus wants us to have joy. Paul says, rejoice, and again I say unto you, rejoice. And so it's so important that we learn how to get along, how to enjoy the people in our lives. And, and so let me ask you this morning, as we begin, do some, some introspective looking. Let me ask you, do you enjoy all the people in your life at home? Do you enjoy your spouse? You know, I think sometimes we endure our, our <laughs> people rather than enjoy people. Do you enjoy your children? Do you enjoy the people that you work with when you, when you get up and go to work tomorrow morning? Do you enjoy those relationships that you have? Um, Ecclesiastes 9.9 9 says... Uh, enjoy life with your wife whom you love and I think there are a lot of people who do not enjoy they tolerate uh, and, and that's not in, not pleasing nor is it in accord with the will of God so what does it take to enjoy the people in your life four keys that we see in this first chapter or these verses 3 through 11 that Paul gives us number one if you want to enjoy people in your life be grateful for the good in people let me say that again. Be grateful for the good in people. Notice in verse 3, Paul says, I thank my God every time I what? remember you. Every time I remember you. Paul is saying, folks, there in Philippi, as I write this letter, every time you come to my mind, I say, God, thank you for those people uh, at Philippi. He, he's saying, I like to remember the good things. I like to remember the good experiences that I had there at Philippi. I like to remember the good times and the positive experiences that we had. Now, let me ask you a question. What do you think when you think about certain people? What, what, are, are there people, I may go to preaching now, are there people that when their name comes to mind, you say, oh. <laughs> huh? Uh, and, and just immediately you, your mind is flooded with negative thoughts. You know, you've had bad experiences. Uh, sometimes we like that. And, and you may be, as I, as I share this, you may be saying, oh, you know, that was easy for Paul to say. I mean, he had a lot of good Christian brothers and sisters back there in Philippi and no doubt had a lot of good experiences in Philippi. Well, yeah, he had some good experiences, but do you remember Acts 16? Acts 16 tells about Paul in the city of Philippi. We don't have time to go to it now. Let me just recap it for you. Paul was, uh, was beaten in Philippi. Paul was whipped in Philippi. Paul was arrested illegally in Philippi. Paul was thrown in prison in Philippi. Paul was humiliated in Philippi. While in prison, he went through an earthquake. Somebody said that was the original jailhouse rock. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, after he was out of prison, Paul was asked to leave town. And that, you know, that's not a lot of good experiences. That's a lot of bad experiences. And so he didn't have a good time as such in Philippi. He could have easily, Paul could have easily said, folks, when I think of you in Philippi, horrors. But he didn't say that. He said, when I think about you, I thank God for you. Every time I remember you, I thank God for you. And so what we are seeing is that Paul, though he could have easily dwelt on the negative, he could have easily dwelt upon the painful memories, he chose not to remember the painful, and he focused on the things that he could be thankful for. Now, listen, let's apply this. I may be talking to some, I may be talking to a lot of you today who've been hurt by somebody else. Maybe you've been hurt by a parent. Maybe you've been hurt by a spouse. Maybe you've been hurt by a friend. And, and, and you may still be holding on to that hurt. And, and just every time you, you think about it, it, that's what comes to mind. And you, you focus on that. 
And as a result, you don't enjoy those people. You can't enjoy them today. You're still focusing on the bad, the negative. When you listen to this, folks, pleasant memories are a choice. Pleasant memories are a choice. Likewise, negative memories are a choice. You ever hear somebody, maybe you said this, uh, somebody has, has done something wrong and they come and apologize and you say, well, I'll forgive you, but what's the rest of it? I'll never forget. Have you, have you heard people say that? You know what they're saying when they say, but I'll never forget? They're saying, all right, I guess, I, I mean, I'm a Christian. I've got to forgive you. I don't have a choice in the matter. But mind you, I am making a mental note. I am choosing. I am filing it away right here in, in my file cabinet that whenever I think of you, I will remember what you did. No, don't worry. I've forgiven you. I forgive, I forgive you. Don't worry. I'll just remember it. And whenever I... And, and, and what I'm saying is... You know, whenever I think of you, whenever I see you, bingo, I remember the negative thing you did. You see, it's a mental choice. We can choose to remember the negative. We can choose to remember the positive. Now, have you ever heard a wife say, he's a good man, in reference to her husband, he's a good man, but... Or, or, or have you ever heard a husband say, in reference to his wife, she's, she's a good woman, but... And, and just immediately when you hear the but, what do you think? Negative coming. Huh? Uh, yeah, he, he's, he takes good care of me. He pays the bills, but. Uh, and and what, we're, what that person is saying is, I have chosen to accent, I have chosen to focus, I have chosen to, to, to zero in on, I have chosen to remember the negative things about the one who loves me most. How illogical. And, and you can't enjoy people when you do that, whether it's husband, wife, friend, a fellow Christian, co-worker. You can't enjoy people when you do that. And whenever I hear someone say that, husband or wife, say, you know, I, I, he's a good man or, or she's a good woman, but I want to say, be thankful for what you've done. Be thankful for the positive. Ladies, Mr. Perfect does not exist. Men, Mrs. Perfect does not exist. I remember hearing one time an audience was asked by the speaker in a, in a context like we're talking about today, do you know any perfect men? This one fellow raised his hand and said, yes. The speaker was taken back. He said, you do? Who? He said, my wife's first husband. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not so. There are no perfect people. Uh, and so, key number one, you want to enjoy the people in your life, uh, remember, be grateful for the good in people. Number two, practice positive praying. Practice positive praying. As we look at this passage, it, most of it is a prayer. In verse 4, he says, In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray how with joy. How would you like to have, if you'd been in the church of Philippi, wouldn't it have been neat to have, heard, to have read that and to, to have thought, man, Apostle Paul, praying for me. He's praying for me by name. Uh, it's encouraging to, to me today, isn't it, to you when somebody comes up to you and says, I want you to know I'm praying for you. Boy, it just boosts me and, and, and lifts me up. It is an encouragement. Uh, what's the lesson? Well, lesson here, in fact, I didn't, I didn't give you the first lesson, did I? On your blank? Okay, let's back up just a little bit. The first lesson was remember the best and forget the rest. Remember the best, forget the rest. Now, lesson number two is thinking that if, that if the, the quickest way to change a relationship from bad to good is to start thanking God in prayer for people. Let me say that again. Thanking God in prayer for people. Now, what, what will that do? Now, when I say thanking God in prayer for people, I'm not saying in your daily prayers you say, Dear God, thank you for people. <laughs> I'm not even saying, say, Dear God, thank you for the people in my life. What I'm saying is, Dear God, 
thank you for the name this name and that name and, and, and somebody else now what's that going to do two things it'll change your attitude toward the people and it will change them it'll, it'll change your if there's somebody that you just really have is there somebody at work that you're just really having a difficult time with it seems like every day you clash and, you know you never see things alike and you just you start praying for that person by name by name dear god please be with and put that person's name and, and pray daily for that person, you know what's going to happen? It's going to change your attitude toward that person. I tell you what, it is impossible. It is absolutely impossible to stay upset with somebody you're praying for by name daily. You can't do it. It's impossible. And so first of all, it's going to, pray, it's going to change your attitude toward that person. Secondly, and thankfully, it'll change the person. Did you realize that? I dare you to do it. I dare you to <laughs> Take that person that you're just constantly having difficulties with and you start doing what I'm talking about, that person who's a real thorn in the flesh, and you start talking to God about him or her every day and, and you watch what happens. Folks, positive praying is much more powerful than positive thinking. It, it really is. You see, uh, the interesting thing is that people can resist your advice, they can resist your suggestions, they can resist your offer to help, they can resist your conversation, they can't resist your praying for them. They can't keep you from praying for them. And Paul says, I pray with joy. In other words, I, I'm not saying, you know, tomorrow morning you get to work and that person just, here he comes. And you say, oh, no, I remember what Jimmy said this morning. Oh, God. <sighs> I guess I've got to. Please help. I, no. <laughs> As Paul says, I do it with joy. It's, it's fun. You practice positive praying, and the greatest thing that you can do for other people is to pray for them. But now here's an important question, and you may have already asked it. Okay, Jimmy, a great idea, but what do we pray? You know, when you pray for these people, you see, we're, we're good at praying for people in a crisis. You know, somebody's getting ready to go to the hospital, we say, hey, I'll pray for you. Dear Lord, please help this person get through surgery. Somebody comes to you and says, hey, Jimmy, we're having family problems with you. I, yeah, great. I mean, you know, please be with, with this couple that are having family problems. Please help this young person get a passing grade. Please help. Crisis praying is easy. But, but what do you pray for when you just you got this name and you're going to pray for them? What do, you, what do you pray? Paul lays it out for us. He knew we'd be asking this question. And, and, and so he outlines it for us in verses 9 through 11. He says, and this is my prayer that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through, through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. He tells us right there at least four things that, that we ought to, that we can, that we should uh, pray for people on a regular basis. Let me, let me give it to you in outline form. You got a place there on your outline for it? Uh, you know that these are God's will for other people. Pray, first of all, that they will grow in love. So when, you know, you, you come to my name on your prayer list, you say, God, please help Jimmy to be more loving, and I'll thank you for it. Yeah, I don't care how loving we are. We can always grow in love, can't we? You never go wrong, go wrong in, in praying for somebody to be more loving, more forgiving, more tolerant uh, of other people. Number two, pray that they'll make wise choices. Is there anybody here today who would not appreciate the prayers of a couple hundred people that tomorrow you'll make a wise choice, make a wise decision in, in whatever is, is facing you? Number three, pray that that person will do the right thing. Paul says to, that you'll be pure and blameless. And so just pray, God, please help my husband to do the right thing today. Please help my wife to do the right thing, to be pure in your sight. Number four, that they'll live for God's glory, filled with the fruit of righteousness. And so as you take that prayer list, and folks, let me tell you, uh, you know, you've heard me say this before, a sermon's not done when I'm finished. You, you know that, don't you? Uh, and you can take this, and, and as soon as we get out of here and you go out of those doors and get in the car, period, end, that's it. If this sermon is going to do anything, you've got to put it into action. And, and what that means is if you're going to make this practical, 
sometime today before you forget it. Before it gets cold uh, or, or first thing in the morning, you need to take a sheet of paper and, and sit down and say, okay, the people in my life that I really want to enjoy are, and you start writing the names down. And it may be two, it may be ten, I, hopefully it's more than two. Uh, <laughs> But these are the people I really want to enjoy, my, my spouse, my parent, my children, uh, and my co-worker. I want to enjoy them. And, and then I decide, or somewhere on that same sheet of paper, just jot down those four points that Paul tells us to pray. That, so we'll remember. I, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray that Keith will love me more. Uh, like they scared the daylights out of me the other day. I, Keith, you need to love me more. Uh, <laughs> but but put those things on the on the list. And if you want to enjoy the people around you, practice positive prayer. Thirdly, the third key is if you want to enjoy the people around you, be patient with their progress. Be patient with their progress. Now, you see, Paul enjoyed people. Why? I think because he looked at their future and not on their past. He saw their potential and he was patient with them. Notice in verse 6, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. That's so gratifying. You see, what Paul is saying is what God starts, God finishes. And that's so different from, from us. We, we start things and we don't finish them. Man has, you know, his unfinished symphonies and his unfinished buildings and his unfinished books and his unfinished projects and, and, and on and on the list goes. But God is able to finish what he starts. And the Bible says that when Jesus Christ starts working in your life, he's going to complete what he started. In spite of the hang-ups, in spite of the, the, the faults, in spite of my bad decisions, in spite of sin in my life, in spite of all the circumstances that I face in my life, God is going to finish what he started in my life and in your life, too. Now, I've, I've got a, a wish. I, you know, I wish that we each could go through life wearing a sign around our neck as Christians. Now, this is just for the church, for, for Christian people. Besides, if we could just take a piece of poster board about, about that wide and about like that, and attach some string to it where we just hang it up. Every morning you get up and get dressed, hang the sign around your neck. It'd have two words on it, under construction. Just wear it. I think I'm going to do that. Uh, maybe I can get it started. You see, if, if you see me tomorrow, and, and when you see me, you see this sign that says under construction, what, what are you going to think? What, what am I saying? I'm saying, please be patient. Be patient with me. Pardon the dust. God is still working. I'm not finished yet. God is not finished with me yet. Therefore, there may be some rough edges. Therefore, I may say something that, that irritates you. Therefore, I may forget to do something that you wanted me to do. I, you know, I, I might do something that, that you don't like under construction be patient that's what paul is saying i'm not what i used to be thank god but he's also saying i'm not what i'm going to be thank god and i couldn't help but think as i was thinking about paul i thought man jim as long as you've been around avalon there's probably some folks at avalon who are saying jim is not what he used to be thank god <laughs> Uh, and, and there may be some of you who may be sitting there right now saying, I hope he's not what he will be, thank God. Uh, so, so be patient. Yeah. If you see me with that sign, okay, you'll know what I'm talking about. If you really want to start enjoying the people in your life, you've got to learn to be patient with people. Let me apply this. In your marriage, if you really want, folks, if you really want to start enjoying your marriage, you really want to enjoy it, you've got to learn to enjoy your mate when? Right now right now, while allowing for growth and development. Not when, not when that spouse, that husband, that wife starts doing this or starts doing that. Starts becoming what I really want him to be or what I really want her to be. Then I will start enjoying the relationship. Oh, how many couples are caught in that trap? And the wife is saying, oh, you know, just as soon as I get him whittled out and, and, 
just just like I want him to be, then I'm going to really start enjoying him. Or, or the wife is, or, or the husband is saying, boy, just, just as soon as I get her, her to take all those habits that I wanted to have and do away the ones that I wanted to do away with, then I'm, boy, this is going to be a good marriage then. I am really going to start enjoying her. I've got news for you, folks. You know you want. You really, because as soon as he starts doing that particular thing, you're going to have something else. Isn't that right? As soon as she starts doing an, an act that you're going to have something else you want her to, to measure out then. Parents, if you're going to start enjoy, if you're going to enjoy your kids, you've got to learn to enjoy them in the process. In the process of growing up. You know, it irritates me no end when I hear parents say, oh, I'll be so glad when they do, when they get through this. Or, or, or it really irritates me when I hear parents say, Long about August 15th. Boy, I'll be so glad when school starts and I can get the kids out of here. You ever say that? Don't shake your head. Uh, <laughs> what am I saying? You've got to enjoy them in the process. Uh, folks, there is no such thing as a perfect kid. By the way, there's no such thing as a perfect parent either, is it? If you're going to, if you're going to demand perfection from the people in your life, before you start enjoying them, I've got news for you, you're going to be miserable. And in the process, you're going to make them miserable at the same time. And so Paul says, man, I enjoy these Philippians. Why? Because I choose to ignore the bad things that happen, and I choose to concentrate on the good, and I'm grateful for the good things that happen. And notice in the text there, he said, being confident. Circle that, being confident. What's he saying? Paul is saying, that he believed in God's power to change human personality. Did you get that? He is saying, I know God can bring some changes about it. Paul believed that no person was hopeless. That's so different from the way we are sometimes. He wasn't the kind of person who, who would say, oh, my husband will never change. My wife, boy, I wish she'd change, but I guess she'll just always be the same. Or my kids are worthless. They'll never amount to anything. Paul wasn't that kind of person. Nor would he say, I can't change. You, you know, uh, sometimes people say, well, in regards to a, to a bad habit or a bad temper or something, they say, well, that's the way I am. You got to hate me the way I am. No, I don't either. <laughs> uh, you may be taking you the way that you are, but I'll pray for you, and I think God can change you. God's got the power. His Holy Spirit can work, and, he, and he, can, he can change people. Paul never gave up on people. Paul would have never been the kind of person who said, my boss will never become a Christian. He says. Paul would never make a statement, my wife will never become a Christian. My husband will never become a Christian. Who says? Paul knew that God could work. You see, what he's talking about here is faith. There's tremendous power in faith. What do you expect out of people? It's what you're getting. And our mistake, and this is on your outline, is that we judge others by how far they have to go rather than by how far they have come. Do you see the mistake there? We, we need to just start being patient with people in their progress. We're under construction. Let's recap. Paul so far has said, learn to enjoy people. Being, being grateful for the good in their lives, practicing positive praying, and being patient with the progress. Finally, the last key in this passage is, he says, if you want to enjoy the people in your life, love people from the heart. Love people from the heart. You, you know, I've made a discovery, and you probably have too. I've discovered in my own life that if people are not on my heart, they're a lot of times on my nerves. <laughs> Isn't that right? And I, if they're not on my heart, they just tend to get on my nerves. But you want to know, and you want to know the reason that so many marriages in American society today are crumbling? It's because mates are reacting to each other from their minds rather than from their hearts. That's, that's the, the bottom line. Let, let me illustrate. The husband or the wife, let me use the wife because she usually comes from this direction. You wives, you ladies used to speak from feeling, I think, more so than, than we guys. And guys, we always make the same mistake. But your wife comes in and, and she shares a feeling. 
she shares an emotion. She, she tells you how um, she's feeling. She says, you know, I just feel this way. And usually the husband reacts from the mind. And, and so he begins, he says, hey, wait a minute. You shouldn't feel that way. That's dumb. <laughs> That's illogical. It doesn't make sense. As a matter of fact, I can just real quickly think of three, no, four reasons why you shouldn't feel that way. Let me straighten you out. Let me get you, let me sit, let me so get you straightened out so that you will be intellectually enlightened and you won't feel that way anymore. Does it work? Never. It doesn't work, does it? Husbands, listen to what your wives are saying. Vice versa, wives, listen to your husbands. You see, listening and loving from the heart hears the hurt or the emotion behind the words. There's always more than just the words that we need to hear. We need to hear the emotion behind it. And, and this heart loving that I'm talking about will do that because, you see, it begins with understanding. I don't think it's on your outline. You may want to write it down. Heart love begins with understanding. And I'm not just talking about husband and wife. I'm talking about people generally, all the people in your life. Why in the world does that guy work that act like the jerk that he is? Huh? Well, it, it may be you need to understand some of his background. You may need to understand the home life that he come, that he grew up in and, the, and the, the, the mate that he left at home when he came to work that morning. You may need to understand that he's not nearly as bad now, as bad as he is, as he was five years ago. There may need to be some understanding. You can't love somebody you don't understand. And understanding them makes it easier to love them. The most common complaint of husbands and wives alike. Wives say, my husband doesn't understand me. And, and, uh, and, and husbands say, my wife, my wife doesn't understand me. Understanding is so important. What, is a, what a comfort it is to know when someone fully understands you. Isn't it? Isn't it so gratifying when you, when you come up and say, yeah, and he, he understands what I'm saying. And folks, if you care, you'll be aware, and you'll be alert, and you'll be careful to try not to say some of the dumb things that, that, that we say at the, at the wrong time. Now, you may be asking also, okay, now we need to understand them, Jimmy, but, but how do you love those people that even after you understand them, they're still so unlovable? You know, how, how do you do that? Well, look at the next verse. It's on your outline. Paul said, God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. With the affection of Christ Jesus. Circle that word, affection. And it's interesting, in the King James translation, if you have that, he's saying, I love you with the bowels of Jesus Christ. Ugh. And in fact, the Greek that's translated affection in the NIV and bowels in, in the King James it means intestine. And so he's saying, I love you with the intestines. I, you know, but you've got to understand, in the Greek world, they thought of the seat of the motion as being right here. Oh, we've raised a little bit. Yeah. You ever seen a heart? That's a yuck, too, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, so I guess it really doesn't make a whole lot of difference whether you say, I love you with all my heart, I love you with all my liver, I love you with all my spleen, or what's Paul saying? Paul is really saying, you get past the internal organ, he's saying, I have an intense, an intense love uh, for you. Uh, I have an intensive love that makes me love even the unlovely. And folks, that's not a natural, it is a supernatural kind of love. And that's why he says, it's not for myself, but it is the affection of Jesus Christ. Listen, human love wears out. Human love dries up. Human love dies on the vine. And some of you, even as I talk today, you may be in a relationship where that human love has just died on the vine. It's just dried up, worn out. But you, you've got to realize that God, if you'll allow him to, will make a different kind of love to, to appear uh, and, and, and come in, in that place. I, I hear people say, 
you know, oh, I don't love him anymore. I hear a husband say, well, I don't love her anymore. And, and I want to say, so what? Big deal. That happens to everybody. Because human love does dry up. But the only kind of love that lasts and lasts is God's love, the affection of Jesus Christ. Look at Romans 5.5. 5. God has, that's supposed to be poured. God has poured out his love into our hearts by means of the Holy Spirit who is God's gift to us. What's he saying? He's saying, look, he, he's saying that, that love is not, some, this kind of love is not something you work up. You know, you just reach down, grab your bootstraps, and, and, and you say, I'm going to love him if it kills me. Yeah. Or, I love you. <clears throat> Boy, that hurt. Yeah. Uh, that's not the kind of, that's not what he's saying. He is saying that it's not something that you work up. It is something, rather, that is poured into my life as I allow his Holy Spirit to move in me moment by moment. As I do what God wants me to do, as I stay in his word, as I pray, and as I uh, pray, God, please fill me with your spirit, and, and I do the things that he wants me to do, God then is going to take over. And, and okay, that person is unlovely. That person is unlovable. Do you realize that God loved you when you were unlovable? When, when God looked at you, you know what he saw? Sin. And there wasn't anything lovely about us. And yet God loved you. And he loved me. And that's what he said. Okay, maybe the person is a jerk. Maybe he is hard to get along with. You can't do it on your own. But God can. If you really want to enjoy the people in your life, then you're going to start practicing that heart love, the affection of Jesus Christ. Impatient, looking for the good, praying for that person. And God will work. And you'll start really, really enjoying life. Why? Because you enjoy the people that you're around. Though they are imperfect, though they're not all that you would like for them to be, at the same time, you're not all that they would like for you to be nor are any of us all that God would have us to be. Under construction, let's be patient and enjoy each other. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for loving us when we were so unlovable. And Father, we know that there are even times today, times in our lives now that we're not very lovable. And yet we know that you love us with a perfect love. And Father, I just pray that today... But as we draw this message to a close and as we reflect in our own individual lives, that you would help us to enjoy the people in our lives, the people that you've placed in our lives. Help us, Father, to be a great witness to them in our love for them. In Jesus' name, amen. Today our closing hymn is hymn number 471 that says very simply the way of the...